So I have that it's 1.15 and we will start right um, in with our first presentation following the lunch. Thank you all for coming back promptly. I want to introduce Amina Salamova, who is currently an associate scientist in the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University, Bloomington. She holds a PhD in environmental science from Indiana University, and her research focuses on understanding the effects of exposure to semi-volatile organic compounds, a group of toxic pollutants in vulnerable populations and in the built environment. She uses state-of-the-art analytical chemistry techniques in exposure assessment and biomonitoring. Amina will talk about increased human exposure to QACs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for that introduction. Can you confirm you can hear and see my presentation? Yeah. Hello? We can, can hear, you hear me? You. I'm sorry? Yes, we can hear and see you. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm Amina Salamova. Uh, I'm an associate scientist at Indiana University. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share my research here in this meeting. And today I would like to speak about increased human exposure to QACs during the COVID-19 pandemic. And really our interest in this, um, in this class of chemicals um, uh, um, was because of the pandemic. We, uh, we've learned a lot, I'm sure as many of you, um, about disinfection, um, uh, our indoor space, both our homes and uh, the public spaces to keep us safe. And in fact, the US EPA has a list, which is called List M, that has more than 400 different products listed as effective for the novel coronavirus. And about uh, half of these products have QACs listed as uh, ing uh, active ingredients. So as it already was mentioned in this meeting, this is a large group of chemicals, uh, probably including hundreds of different compounds uh, that are used in many different applications. And in addition to being used, in disinfection and cleaning products, they are used in biocides, personal care products, uh, medical, pharmaceutical products, and even in textiles. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will focus on three major QAC groups that have already been mentioned before. So benzyl alkyl dimethyl ammonium compounds, or BACs, um, di uh, dialkyl uh, dimethyl ammonium compounds, or DDACs, they are also called um, um, that, that max, uh, but for uh, we call them DDACs, um, and uh, alkyl trimethyl ammonium compounds, or FMAX. Uh, and each group has several uh, homologs depending on the length of the um, um, alkyl chain. And here I will focus on C6 and C18 BACs and C8 to uh, C18 DDACs and FMAX. So a total of 19 QACs. So when we started looking into this group of compounds, we have found out that they are mostly detected in the outdoor environment. And some of this work we've heard from Bill Arnold in the previous talk, uh, but they've been detected in wastewater, sludge, surface water, sediments, and soils. Um, some toxicity data exist on some of these BACs, mostly based on uh, animal studies and exposure to uh, to QACs has been associated with birth defects, disruption of lipid metabolism, developmental toxicity. And in some occupational studies, they've been recognized as asthmogens because they exacerbated asthma symptoms. But we were really surprised to find out that there is virtually no data on uh, human exposure and human exposure pathways and health effects um, based on epidemiological studies. So uh, today we'll talk about two projects that were done on the QAC exposures. And the first project will focus on indoor exposure. So we were interested sort of in general evaluation or assessment of the indoor exposure to QACs, especially during the pandemic, uh, you know, considering the increased use of these chemicals. Um, so we have uh, chosen to use dust as an exposure assessment approach or tool. Um, uh, of the QAC exposures in the indoor environment because dust is relatively easy to work with and to collect. Um, and also uh, dust is a, a long-term uh, source and sink of many semi-volatile organic compounds. Uh, so uh, we uh, wanted to look at the QAC exposures in the indoor dust. But in addition to this, we also wanted to see uh, or evaluate the effect of the pandemic on the QAC levels indoors, and also evaluate the effects of using disinfecting products and disinfection practices in homes that were sampled. 
So this work was published last year in the SNP letters, and um, I can share the paper with uh, whoever is interested uh, to get more details on this work. So for the purposes of this study, we've collected uh, dust samples all here in Bloomington, Indiana. We were able to um, access um, dust samples collected before the pandemic from a sample archive. These samples were collected during 2018 to 2019. And uh, we were also interested, uh, we were also, we also collected samples uh, during the pandemic. Uh, with, this was done in June 2020. Um, we were not able to get to people's homes because of safety. And uh, we asked people to give us dust from their back and backs. Uh, from the homes that were sampled during the pandemic, we asked the residents to give us information on the common disinfection products they use and also disinfection practices and disinfection frequency, um, basically information on how, dis how they disinfect their homes. Based on this information, we identified uh, seven commonly used disinfecting products. Uh, this included uh, both sprays and wipes, and we analyzed the network. So along with this, just for purely exploratory purposes, uh, we also wanted to look at the levels of QACs in air, this was done only uh, only in three samples. We were able to collect only three samples because air sampling is much more difficult than dust sampling. It takes more time, um, and um, even though it's a very small uh, sample size and exploratory work, I, I still wanted to share some of our results with you because we think we have some interesting results. So just briefly on the dust analysis, we, we sieved the dust and we ultrasonicated it with acetonitrile to extract the QACs. Um, uh, our surrogate recoveries were pretty good, showing that our method efficiency was pretty good. We didn't have much of blank issues. Uh, the blank levels were less than 0.1%, uh, constituted less than 0.1% of the sample levels. Uh, and like I already mentioned, we analyzed for 19 QACs using liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. And you can find more details on the analysis in our paper I mentioned before. So uh, moving on to the results, you can see here the levels for the 19 QACs we've targeted, shown as box plots. Um, and this is the data for the two sample groups, the uh, pre-pandemic and during pandemic samples kind of pulled together. Um, the concentrations here shown as box plots. Um, the boxes represent 25th and 75th percentiles. The whiskers represents 10th and 19th percentiles. And the black line inside the box represents the median. The y-axis shown as a on a log scale and the x-axis shows the number of carbons in the alkyl chain for each QAC shown here. So first of all, I would like to mention that um, uh, almost all QACs we've targeted were detected in each and every sample we've analyzed. So our minimum detection frequency was 95%. So uh, to our surprise, the, the exposure to QACs was quite widespread in the homes we sampled. Uh, the concentrations were pretty high. You can see the concentrations are on the microgram per gram level. Uh, these are considered high concentrations for the indoor environment. And, you know, when we compare the levels with other most uh, well-known and um, ubiquitously fine compounds like flame retardants, both brominated flame retardants and aganophosphate flame retardants, the QAC levels were several times higher. Um, they reached up to several hundreds microgram per gram in these samples. Um, when we look at the distribution of QACs here, we can see that the most abundant QACs found in the samples were um, uh, B, uh, C12 and C14 BACs, uh, C8 and C10 DDACs, and C16 APMAC. Um, and uh, overall, um, these five compounds uh, contributed about 80% to the total QAC concentrations. Um, and total QAC concentrations here are defined as the sum of the all 19 QACs. Uh, we know that some of these compounds are uh, high production uh, volume chemicals in the United States. So we think that this can uh, probably explain some of our findings here. So when we look at the um, uh, two sample groups, so uh, separately, so samples collected during the pandemic and before the pandemic, 
we can see that the total QAC concentrations in samples collected during the pandemic, shown here, are significantly higher than in the samples collected before the pandemic. And in fact, there is about a 60% increase um, based on the median total QAC concentrations. And when, when we've looked at some of the individual QACs, um, this increase was about 90%. Um, we wanted also to look into the effect of disinfection practices in these homes. So based on the survey information from the homes um, uh, sample during the pandemic, uh, we um, were able to identify different disinfections routine in homes. So um, in homes that reported increased disinfection routine since the outbreak of the pandemic, um, the total QAC concentrations were significantly higher than in homes that did not change their disinfection practices since the outbreak of the pandemic. In, in fact, the median for the homes that was um, that uh, have reported increased disinfection since the outbreak uh, were about three times higher than in homes with no change. Uh, we've also looked into the differences based on uh, how many times people disinfected their homes. So the homes that disinfected more frequently, defined here as disinfecting a few times a week, um, where uh, the total QAC concentrations were significantly higher than in homes that disinfected less frequently, defined here as less than uh, once a week, or did not use um, um, chemical containing products. So they just use isopropyl alcohol. Um, these homes also had significantly lower levels. In fact, there was a, a, a strong linear relationship between the frequency, how many times people uh, disinfected their homes, and the uh, uh, total QAC concentrations. So now just briefly about the air concentrations. Again, I would like to point out this is exploratory work. We only have three samples here. Uh, we use this um, type of um, uh, passive air samplers, which is um, called uh, polyurethane foam samplers or puff samplers. Uh, there is a piece of foam sitting here underneath the, this dome, and this sample is deployed uh, in the house and uh, stays there for about uh, four weeks and basically uh, passively samples the air uh, or contaminants from the surrounding air. So, um, to our surprise, we were able to detect uh, QACs, a range of QACs, uh, in all of three samples. Um, and uh, the most abundant uh, chemicals found in the samples were uh, C12 FMAC, shown here, uh, followed by C12 to C16 BACs, and then C14 FMAC. So these five compounds were uh, more frequently detected. They were detected in, about, uh, in, in, all, of our, in all of our samples. Um, and at quite high concentrations, especially for C12 FMAC, the concentration reached up to 2,000 picogram per cubic uh, meter. And again, when we compare it with um, the more widespread uh, and well-known uh, indoor contaminants like flame retardants, for example, um, again, this, uh, these levels are several times higher um, than for those chemicals. And the mean uh, total QAC concentration was about 4,000 picogram per cubic meter. So um, we were quite, quite surprised by these findings because uh, QACs are believed to be non-volatile. But when we look at the relationship between the um, log of the uh, octanal air uh, partition coefficient uh, and the relationship of this partition coefficient with the ratio uh, of uh, all of the QACs that we looked at in dust uh, to, the uh, to the concentration in air, uh, because these air uh, samples were paired with dust samples, uh, we see that there is uh, almost like inverse um, U-shaped relationship here. And these two FMAX that we see in our eight uh, air samples uh, fall uh, pretty low on this, on this curve. Um, the, their uh, partition coefficients are quite low, and uh, the dust to uh, air ratios are pretty low as well. So these two compounds are pretty volatile because they have um, a lower uh, octanal air coefficient, partition coefficients. And that's, uh, we think, is the reason why we see, it. we see them in our air samples. The BACs that we see kind of fall higher on the curve. And we, see, we think that the reason why we see them in our air samples 
is because the, the pop samplers uh, are also able to capture very fine particles uh, from, from the air, from the indoor air. Uh, so we think that that's the reason uh, why we see this PACs in the air samples. That's probably due to the presence of the very fine particles in the foam. Um, so if you remember, I also mentioned that we've also analyzed um, disinfection products used in the homes that were sampled during the pandemic. And when we looked at this data, we realized that there is three products that are uh, pretty much exclusively used in more than 80% of the homes. So here I'm showing, I'm sorry, uh, here I'm showing the distribution of the three QAC groups that we've looked at. Um, their contribution to the total QAC concentrations uh, shown here as a percentage. Um, the, uh, this pattern in dust samples from those 80% of the homes where uh, these products are used, and this is an average contribution for those three exclusively used products in this 80% of the homes, and also in our uh, three air products. So when we look at this, when we compare the dust pattern and the product pattern, we see that the similarity is quite striking. So this suggests to us that these products could be a source uh, of the these QACs in the indoor dust. However, when we compare with the air, we can see that the pattern here is quite different. At max are the major contributors to the air concentrations. And um, this suggests to us that air can probably have different, uh, different sources uh, of, of these compounds. We know that at max are used uh, in some of the um, air fresheners and in some of the perfumes, and they are more volatile. So um, uh, some of these products can be a source uh, of the Atmax in the indoor air. So in a conclusion for this project, uh, our results show that the indoor exposure to QACs is quite widespread. QACs can be found in the, in the indoor air. Uh, the QAC levels are significantly higher in dust collected during the pandemic and also higher in homes with uh, uh, more frequent disinfection. And we think that disinfection products can be a significant source of the QACs in house dust. So moving on to the second project that I would like to talk about today, uh, as an exposure scientist, I'm always interested in biomonitoring of uh, emerging contaminants. So um, finding uh, this widespread uh, exposure to QACs in the indoor environment got us thinking, you know, if these chemicals are also found in human blood. So in order to um, look into this, we collected samples from the Indiana University Biobank. Again, we were interested to look at general levels of QACs in human blood. And we also wanted to see if there is effect from the pandemic uh, on the QAC levels in blood. So we collected two samples of uh, two, two groups of samples similarly to dust. So blood collected before the pandemic. This was serum collected during February to August of 2019, total of 111 samples. And blood collected during the pandemic. Uh, this was done in April to August 2020, again 111 samples. And again, particip uh, here participants um, were not paired. So th these two groups of samples were not collected from the same people because uh, human research subject uh, human subjects research was quite uh, difficult to do during the pandemic in terms of collection of biological samples uh, but um, the participants in these two groups were matched based on age gender uh, race smoking status uh, residence and bmi So uh, again, briefly about the analysis, we extracted the blood with acetonitrile. We cleaned them up on the solid phase, um, uh, uh, solid phase extraction uh, columns. Um, our recoveries were quite good. We did have, in this case, some issues with our blanks. Um, but again, in general, the blanks level did not exceed 20% of our sample levels. Uh, but nonetheless, we decided to be safe and we blank corrected all of our data by subtracting the blank levels from the sample levels. Um, so moving on to the results, here I'm showing the data for the 10 QACs that were detected in more than 40% of the samples. Um, again, the concentrations are shown as box plots here. Uh, when we look at this data, we see that 
the most abundant chemicals here uh, are C12 to C14 ethanol, qu quite similar to the air concentrations, and C12 and C14 BACs. Uh, these four chemicals were found in about 80 to 90 percent of the blood samples, so quite high detection frequency. Um, the levels ranged from three to six uh, nanogram per mil. Um, and when we look at the two groups of uh, samples uh, collected before the pandemic and during the pandemic, we can see here the trend similar to what we see in dust. So there is a, a significant statistical difference between the total BAC, um, total 8 MAC, and total QAC concentrations uh, in samples uh, between the two groups of samples with the samples collected during the pandemic uh, being significantly higher. So if we compare the medians, uh, the medians in the samples collected before, before the pandemic, this is for total QAC concentrations is 3.5 versus 6.0 nanogram per mil, the increase of about 77% so for the total QACs. And when we looked at some individual QACs, especially PACs, this increase was about 170% for some of these chemicals. So again, we, we wanted to look at sort of the distribution pattern of these three QAC groups um, in uh, different sample types. So here I'm comparing the, um, the distribution in, in blood with the distribution in dust and indoor air from the previous study. And we see that the, this distribution is quite different between these three sample types. So uh, serum is pretty much equally enriched with BACs and APMAPs. Uh, dust is um, uh, mostly enriched with BACs, but there is also some BDACs here and some APMAPs. And indoor air is pretty much enriched with APMAPs, uh, about uh, 80, 70 to 80% of APMAPs. Uh, so we think that uh, both uh, dust and air probably can contribute to the levels of QACs we see here. Um, there is different exposure pathways to, uh, to blood, uh, of QACs to blood, and of course this needs more work uh, because we had quite limited sample size. Uh, but uh, I thought it was quite interesting to see the differences between the distribution of the uh, QAC groups in the samples. So our work had limitations, like I already mentioned. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, we had a limited sample size and limited geographic coverage for our samples. Uh, our pre and post pandemic dust, dust and blood samples were not paired uh, because uh, due to the challenges of the sample collection during the pandemic. Uh, also, in our biomonitoring work, we didn't have urine samples, and we know that some of these QACs can metabolize quite quickly in the body. However, the metabolites at this point are, are not known, um, and we were not able to measure them or collect urine samples for their measurements. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, Guo Mojeng, my postdoc, who actually did all the work, uh, all the lab work and all the data work, so really all credit goes to him and uh, my collaborator, Gabriel Filippelli, who helped with uh, obtaining the samples collected before the pandemic and uh, the funding sources. Um, thank you all for listening, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. I mean, I really appreciate that presentation. It's a concise summary of what looks like a, um, a lot of work. We have time now uh, 15 minutes for questions from both the panel and the audience and just as a reminder panel members with questions simply raise your hand and i will spot you and then um, we'll periodically sort of i'll check for questions from the audience so carl please yes thank you for the very clear presentation it does leave a question and i understand this might be might, might or might not be on beyond, beyond your pay grade but I think one of the things that the uh, COVID circumstances have brought about is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, individuals who do the cleaning may do that hour after hour, day after day, and they may have much higher concentrations than 
I gather you're uh, picking up with residues. I take it you're studying residues, either residues in the air, residues in the dust. But what about the people that are down there on the floor or the desktops or the sprayers? Uh, um, spraying this material seems to me their concentrations might be much, much higher. Do you have any insight into that? Uh, well, I completely agree that I think people who use this uh, chemicals, sprayers, uh, cleaners, and other people who may use them um, probably are exposed to much higher levels. Uh, our sampling was done in residential, um, in general population of Indiana, let's say, or Bloomington. Um, none of these people were occupationally exposed to these chemicals, um, as far as we know. So um, we don't have any data on occupational exposure, but I think that's a very interesting angle here. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure the levels in those people would be much higher. So quick, just a quick follow-up then. You didn't look at commercial uh, buildings at all. I mean, where there might be multiple, you know, you think of, they show us pictures of airports where people are cleaning it up, you know, maybe after every, every flight loads and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the exposures are surely are much higher. Seem like yes. it would be. We have not looked at any of this type of buildings. So uh, our, again, we only sampled in residential homes, but uh, I'm sure, for example, one of the places where the levels would be quite high uh, are the hospitals or schools or daycares. Uh, I know that in schools they disinfect very frequently. Um, I've heard that some schools disinfect um, at every break. Uh, they have kids actually wipe their um, desks and etc. So uh, yeah, there are some environments where the levels would be much higher, but we have not had the chance to, um, to do sampling in those environments. Thank you. Similarly, I'm kind of, I'm interested, I don't, I don't think this, um, you know, was covered by your work, but just to flag um, the use of, I think you mentioned, um, you know, in air samples, the use of sprayers, and I understand there's also foggers that are used, which is a much finer particle that's generated mm -hmm. and tends to linger in air much longer and potentially adhere to dust um, and stay airborne and therefore respirable much longer. Um, do you have anything to add about that? I, I know there's been some work even before the pandemic because it was used in, um, it was required for sanitizing ambulances between patient runs. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there were complaints from paramedics about um, acute health effects uh, from exposure to fogged spaces and I, presumably from having to do the fogging themselves. I wonder if you've just encountered any of that uh, science, even though it's outside this, the particular study that you did. Um, I, we, haven't, we haven't had a chance to work with any of those application types. So the, uh, the products that we've looked at or just sort of consumer products, um, commonly used in homes, um, just the consumer sprays and wipes. Um, I can see that the wipes had higher concentrations than the sprays, but again, that's different from what you're talking about. Um, I, I think it's also important to know what kind of, uh, what kind of QACs or what kind of products are used in those colors, you know. Um, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, but I think the way they are um, dispersed could create uh, more lingering in the air and more, maybe lead to more inhalation exposure um, than the products that are used uh, indoors just using the consumer products. Thank you for that. I also saw um, material about um, people's exposure in hospitals, including people who did not use the products, but because they linger in the indoor environment, measurements at nurses stations and um, in areas where a janitor was working, but not spraying them, but maybe mobilizing dust through sweeping and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it all makes, seeing your work makes that all make more sense. Um, I think Tom had a question followed by Vina. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, really good presentation. So thank I'm you. curious if this work is leading, I, I know there's not a lot of information about exposure pathways, but I'm wondering if there's enough early information to start hypothesizing dominant exposure pathways, uh, inhalation, hand to mouth. I'm particularly interested like when a compound 
uh, has a high KOA. Uh, it's very, uh, it has a high preference for lipids, right? So that would indicate that it's it's on surfaces, um, and if you your hands are, have lipid you know, oils and things, it might be uh, it might be retained on the skin more easily than compounds that aren't very lipid soluble. Uh, in addition, it seems to be in the particle phase, probably less in the vapor phase, but that would also suggests kind of the order of magnitude of the inhalation exposure because we can calculate the air, um, air particle or surface particle partitioning. So again, it's a, I'm, I'm hoping that either someone already has begun this or we could begin some, I wouldn't say detailed or, or highly accurate exposure modeling, but at least basing or building sort of the hypotheses that lead us to understand dominant exposure pathways so we can start thinking about intervention. So there is some work, I know uh, one paper that has looked at some of the exposure modeling, looking at different uh, exposure pathways, a paper from Lily, uh, which I believe was uh, published either uh, late last year or maybe earlier this year. Um, and so in that paper, they have looked, they've looked at an exposure model to look at different exposure pathways and they identified that dermal exposure and uh, exposure from surfaces could be an important exposure pathway. Um, they've looked at a total of 22 QACs, I believe. Um, so I think the problem here is that there are so many different QACs um, with different properties, right? So we see this difference between the uh, pattern in air and pattern in dust. Um, so dust is obviously more important for less volatile QACs like BACs, and we see now although up until now uh, there was this consensus that QACs are non-volatile, but we see that some of them are volatile and actually found in indoor air based on our exploratory data. So I think that's something that needs to be more uh, looked into. Um, we see, I did not present this data here, but we see a similar sort of pattern with the outdoor air. Uh, with outdoor air, we were able to collect vapor phase and particle phase contaminants separately. And we see um, a, a similar trend with BACs being more enriched in particle phase and ATMAX being more enriched in the vapor phase. So I, I believe that inhalation also is an important exposure pathway for some of these QACs. Thank you, Vina. Hi, Amina. It's really good to see you. Thank Hi, you Amina. so much for this um, great presentation and uh, really Im important work. My question was around if you saw any differences in exposure levels or patterns um, by age or gender or, or race and, and ethnicity with, within your cohort or if there's been um, any investigation, other investigations of those kinds of trends. So I, I know for other chemicals like flame retardants, young children's greater contact with contaminated dust is um, hypothesized to be a more significant exposure pathway. And and I also, um, you know, for for other chemicals in the home, uh, women are more often doing the cleaning and may have higher exposure. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, we have tried to look into this, but in our data, we didn't see any differences. Our data was pretty homogeneous in terms of uh, age. All of our, you know, it was all adults. We didn't have any children uh, because it was collected. The samples were collected from a biobank at the hospital from surgery patients. So um, it was all adults. Um, we uh, uh, we did not see any differences in terms of um, in in terms of between women and men or based on age or any other um, any other characteristics. Probably because we had a smaller a smaller data set, so that was probably the reason. Unha. Hi, Amina. Um, hi. hi. 
Uh, it's great work and it's very impressive. Um, it's, I'm curious about this could be, you know, we may, you may not know, but I'm kind of wondering, um, you know, we know that the chemicals are accumulating and they're persistent, you know, so, um, so I'm kind of wonder if you have, you, you were able to try to differentiate something like, you know, when you have a dust samples before COVID, after COVID-19, you know, you see that increase the trend, but is there any possibility that these chemicals could accumulate in the dust over time? So this could indicate that longer use of these chemicals, this dust could reflect that accumulation um, impact effect. So remember that the dust were not aired, so they were not collected from the same homes before and during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. in terms of accumulation or longer accumulation, uh, that probably can be ruled out, but it's, uh, it's also in a limitation in a way because we weren't able to uh, con compare the levels in the same home. So there could be some other confounding factors which contribute to the differences we see. Um, but uh, that's, that's what we could do um, due to, because of the limitations of the pandemic in terms of sample collection. Elizabeth, I wanna check in about um, questions from the audience. We currently do not have any, uh, nor do we have any hands raised. Okay, great. So we have about four more minutes before moving on for any other questions from the panel. Jose. Hi, Amina. Thanks for uh, the, the nice presentation. I had just had a um, very basic question about the timing of the air samples in this case. Um, did they coincide I mean, by design, was it just randomly at any time of the day, or did they coincide with soon after cleaning I don't know, floors or, or whatever it is? How, was, how did you design that? Uh, so the air sampling and dust sampling uh, overlapped. Uh, so the dust was collected at some point during the air sampling, but it wasn't linked to any specific event, uh, like cleaning or anything like that. Uh, the nature of the air sampling, um, that's why I mentioned that it's more complicated, that, that uh, the sampler needs to stay out for at least three to four weeks uh, for us to be able to get good detection limits. Uh, and dust collection is pretty quick. So, um, so there was a difference in terms of sample collection time. Okay, so if I understand, so it's roughly a three week to four week average of the air sample that you're having there. Yeah, okay. so oh. the air sampler stayed in homes for uh, four weeks. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Any final quick questions? In that case, thank you so much, Amina, for your presentation. Um, thank you. And we will move on to our next uh, presentation. And I want to introduce uh, Li Bin Zhu, who is an associate professor at the University of Washington, where he started his own lab in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry. His research focuses on the role of lipid metabolism and oxidation in human diseases and the development of novel methodologies for the analysis of lipids, metabolites, drug drugs and drug metabolites using mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry techniques. Lieben will discuss analytical methods to measure QACs in biomonitoring studies. Thanks, Megan, for the introduction. Um, I hope you guys can see well, because I cannot see everyone else. I only have the screen here. We can um, see. That's great. Uh, so it's great to be able to be, visit uh, uh, Biomonitoring California again. Like last year I was here. I remember that was the last time I ever traveled uh, in a, by air. Uh, so I really missed that. But uh, so today I'm gonna uh, touch base on some of the thing I talked about last time, including uh, metabolism, uh, also some analytical methods. 
But I also want to talk about some of the newer data that we uh, generated, uh, human samples. Let's get started. So I think Bill and Amina has done a pretty good introduction on the quaternary ammonia compounds of quacks uh, on their structures and their usage as disinfectants, uh, pesticides, preservatives, and they're very regularly used in a variety of settings. And nowadays, and because of COVID, the use has, uh, you know, uh, times probably increased many times. And uh, including the wipes and also spray, we mentioned about the potential inhalation uh, exposure spray could be, uh, you know, uh, important route because it's been used quite often. And other kind of uh, medical products, uh, eye drops, and also um, dairy products. This is the structure that uh, Bill and Amina has mentioned. I won't uh, go through them all again, but uh, I want to point out that um, uh, we're, this talk we're going to focus on the benzoconium chlorides, which has benzo, dimethyl, and alkyl chain, different chain length, and also uh, the dimethyl ammonium chloride, which has these dialkyl chains and dimethyl groups. So first of all, I want to introduce the method we're using. Uh, we're using uh, a targeted liquid chromatography uh, mass spectrometry method, uh, and we, uh, which is similar, I think, with, with Amina's method, which is also a targeted method. It's a reverse phase column separation uh, with a uh, um, solvent combination of uh, uh, buffer with uh, formic acid and also acetonitrile. The total runtime for this pairing quack compounds are within eight minutes. And we have synthesized uh, deuterated labeled uh, um, standards as internal standards. So we, add, we can add these standards before we process in a sample that will account for on the potential sample loss uh, uh, during the process and also allow the quantitation to be very accurate. And these are the mass transition that we used for the different compound which are specific to that particular compound. And so this is something I mentioned last time, like before, because there's no really human exposure data. And so we kind of outsourced uh, through by IVT to get obtain a hundred random human plasma samples. Uh, and then we did that kind of pilot study. We find that, you know, for uh, 25 to 47 percent probably have detectable level of quacks and for some of individual has pretty high level in, um, uh, including you know about nine percent could have uh, micromolar concentration of these uh, quacks but uh, we do recognize a limitation that, uh, of this study because the sample were not collected by us and then uh, it could be there's possibility for a contamination during their collection process but I'm going to touch on some newer data uh, on collaboration with Terry Rubeck and uh, some of the sample that, uh, you know, uh, collected by themselves and also, uh, I think, controlled very well. Uh, so, but regardless, we can see from this sample that the cracks are prevalent. Uh, that uh, has varied levels among individuals. So uh, our lab has done some you know, um, early study, like I guess it, it's, it's recent, but uh, nobody has really looked look at their metabolism by human uh, human enzymes. So we look at their in, uh, metabolism by human cytochrome p 450 s the main dis, uh, detoxifying enzyme in our liver. So here we use the benzoconium chlorides as examples. And we have reported that last year, uh, basically we have identified enzyme Cytochrome P450 4F11, 4F2, that will make uh, omega hydroxylation products. And the 2D6 and 4F12 will, will make omega minus 1 hydroxylation products. And the omega hydroxylation products can be further converted into omega hydroxylic acid. And what the other one, uh, you know, omega minus 1, can be converted into ketone. And both of this can be converted into this diol, dihydroxy products. And so we have made in synthetic standards for uh, C10 back to conform of this uh, bio transformation pathway. So this is some recent, uh, you know, uh, mechanism we understand uh, that the after they form the primary carboxylic acid products, they can actually undergo uh, beta oxidation like free uh, like fatty acids, 
that will reduce two carbon at a time to form a series of uh, uh, carboxylic acid products. So this is important because uh, that relates to some of the metabolites we have seen in human urine. Uh, we're going to see later. So these are some of the chromatogram that we use to uh, monitor C10 back derived metabolites. These are on targeted methods, the hydroxy products, the dihydroxy, the ketone, and uh, the omega carboxylic acid. And I'm showing here is actually a, a mouse study where he exposed the mouse by diet at this level, 120 microgram per gram per day of quacks containing BAX and also DDAC. And following uh, actually Terry Rubeck's uh, protocol, what we see is that this looking like looking at the kidney tissues, we see uh, on the compounds in there. And we see, I'm showing here metabolites of C14, but we also see other metabolites too, of C12 and C16 back. Uh, interestingly, we also see uh, hydroxylation metabolites of DDAC, uh, although we haven't fully characterized the products of DDAC yet, but we think the oxidation also occur on the long alkyl chain, which uh, we're in the process to characterize those. So in a separate study, we look at, uh, you know, uh, again, the mouse uh, fed on a, um, which in this case, we use a deuterium labeled C13 bag because we find that there may be some contamination from the environment that could obscure our analysis. So we fed them with a D7 deuterium labeled one. Uh, I mean, that we make sure that on the only thing that we, we uh, analyze will be definitely coming from the diet that we fed, uh, fed the mice. So we see again, uh, using the C for C16, we see the parent compound also omega hydroxy, omega carboxylic acid metabolites. Very interestingly is that this is our emphasis, by the way. And we also see a series of uh, beta oxidation products from this omega carboxylic acid. The N equals five, that would be uh, equals to the alcohol chain of 14, uh, that would be 12 and then 10 and eight, uh, even six. So they are on, you know, on the go. What we thought, you know, uh, metabolism by southern corn people 50, followed by the uh, beta oxidation products. So this is the indication that the quacks are absorbed and also uh, they are metabolized by liver and then they are uh, excreted back into the uh, intestine and then into the feces. So this is just summary of our uh, I guess, uh, very, very conservative est estimation of limit of detection, which we can uh, reach a limit de detection of under uh, 0.1 nanomolar and converting to nanogram would be in a, from 10 to up to uh, uh, 90 uh, nanogram per liter. So next I'm gonna talk about some of the newer data that uh, we have uh, done on human uh, samples. The first study is through a collaboration with Terry Rubeck at Virginia Tech. And so uh, they did a, a blood sample collection at uh, Blacksburg, uh, Virginia, which is a college town and um, participant over uh, on 18 years or older, uh, totally is 43 samples collected. And the way we uh, process the samples are like we spiking uh, due to uh, back benzocline chloride internal standards. We did a lipid extraction actually because most of these uh, quacks we analyze are very lipophilic using the Foch solution. And then after drying those, we reconstitute them into LC solvents. And then we do the targeted LC MSMS analysis. So this uh, manuscript is now in preprint. Uh, we are uh, currently doing the revision. Uh, hopefully, that can come out soon. So just to show you what we see, uh, these are picking three samples from this collection, sample four, 17, and 38. Uh, you can see showing the 12 and 14 and 16 uh, in these samples, they have varied levels, depends on the individual. Uh, and uh, even the distribution for the different uh, compounds is a little bit different. We do see D uh, DDAC as well, which is not showing here. And this uh, is a summary of the data we have seen is uh, from, you know, for all 43 samples and different color shows different compounds like 10, 12, 14, and 16 back and also DDAC. 
we can see some of the highest level can reach is uh, 60 some nanomolar for one individual and a total quack in that individual is probably reaching from 100 to 200 nanomolar and there's another pretty high individuals and there are a lot of uh, low nanomolar concentration uh, among uh, on other individuals but we can see the distribution range is quite high and some individual could actually has a uh, really high level of uh, these quacks uh, in their blood so Next, I'm going to talk about some of the pilot study we have done um, on human urine samples. So after last year's meeting, uh, I've uh, kept a uh, communication with Narissa Wu uh, from Biomonitoring California. And so we started uh, this pilot project to look at human urine sample. Uh, for, for one is that in human urine is uh, much easier to collect, uh, particularly during COVID. Um, you can avoid uh, in-person uh, interaction and you can still get urine samples. So these are, I think, from the early uh, staying at home order time collected samples. So first, I want to touch on the uh, you know method, which is you know we set on this method uh, seems to be working pretty well and also uh, very straightforward to work out the samples. Basically, you we add ice cold acetyl nitrile and with duty standards already in there. And then we chill them on ice to uh, participate to proteins. And you do centrifugation uh, and then take the aliquots uh, supernatants out and concentrate them, concentrate them down under vacuum. And then we finally reconstitute them into LC, LC solvent, uh, then do LCMS uh, MS analysis. So this is uh, what I show is from one human uh, urine samples um, and uh, the metabolites we have seen, we didn't see parent compounds in this, in this urine sample. Uh, on the top, chromatogram are from this urine sample. We can see these are all carboxylic, uh, omega carboxylic acid metabolites with the 12, 10, 8, 6, and 4 carbon chain. And the concentration range from one to 16 nanomolar and total is about 45 nanomolar. So if you compare this uh, uh, carboxylic acid metabolite profile with this uh, C16 back incubated uh, products from human hepatocytes, we can see the matching of this uh, uh, omega carboxylic acid metabolites uh, with this profile. But uh, in the human urine, we didn't see 14 and 16. So we're guessing uh, the longest chain in this individual probably is C12 has been exposed, but we're not sure about pairing compound of 10, 8, 6, whether they exist or not, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, the carboxylic acid can undergo beta oxidation to lose two carbon at, and at a time, eventually reach to on these uh, potential products. Um, so in the, in the last part, I want to you know touch base on some of the literature data and on quack uh, disposition that was done in animal models. Uh, hope to give you a, a whole picture of their uh, disposition. Even though there are differences between you know animal, uh, like a particular mouse and rats and a human, um, because mouse and rats do metabolize um, much faster. But I think this is a, some indication if you can uh, potentially uh, extrapolate it into some uh, human uh, disposition data. So these are a couple of uh, uh, studies uh, in early 2000s uh, from in rats after uh, IV or oral intake. The so top one is from the IV injection, uh, seven microgram per gram injection, and the rats were sacrificed 30 minutes later. So you can see the distribution of the uh, bags after this period is the kidney as the highest level, followed by lung and spleen. And the blood level in serum is actually pretty low and liver level is also pretty low. But we know these compounds can be metabolized um, well by liver. And if you look at the uh, oral intake data from 150 uh, microgram per gram of uh, intake, and the rats were sacrificed uh, 24 hours later, you again see the kidney accumulate the highest level of these compounds, followed by lung, and liver is pretty low, and the blood uh, is the lowest. So this is suggesting like, you know, blood may not be the highest level that you can see uh, for these compounds, 
And then also if you will look at our human uh, blood sample, also amino uh, data on human blood samples. Uh, that could be an indication that in other tissues uh, like kidney or lung, maybe they have even higher accumulation uh, for whatever reason. It could be because of their uptake. It could be because of their limited uh, metabolizing uh, capability. So another data I want to present here is uh, some radio label study that has uh, cited often by EPA and FDA. Uh, even though these are unpublished data, uh, but uh, some FDA documents, for example, in, in this particular document cited this and, and uh, including uh, the exact number. And also this recent review also cited this data. So this, this study were done in rats and then fed, uh, fed around with uh, um, C14 labeled benzoylcholine chloride, uh, either by IV or oral dose at 10 milligram per kilogram of uh, dose. And so the feces, urine were collected throughout and also tissue were harvested in N. So as you can see, even with IV dosage, uh, there's a lot of fecal excretion uh, and also urine excretion is 30% uh, remain uh, in the tissue. So this is the indication the urine and feces excretion are major around, particularly for fecal excretion. And for oral doses, as you can see, uh, you know, fe fecal excretion is predominant, followed by urine and tissues uh, normally ranges 1% or less. Uh, that is, I know, after the uh, a week or two collection of uh, samples already. So, but what I wanna really point out in this data is that the from the fecal samples, they have, they find, they find like, about 65% are parent compounds, while 35% metabolites. Uh, they have indication that metabolites are hydroxy or hydroxyketone metabolites, but really they, they didn't figure out uh, the structure of those uh, metabolites. But we know now uh, those primary metabolites could be hydroxy compounds, could be ketone, and could be carboxylic acid. And we know those are formed from human cytochrome P450 that are in the liver. I think that's a very in, uh, you know important uh, you know concept here is that this compound do get absorbed and they do get metabolized. That's how you can see this metabolized. That's it. and uh, after they secrete it uh, back into the intestine. So I hope to give you a whole picture of the you know disposition routes of quacks. Um, they could be have intake through oral intake. Uh, but it could also have intake through inhalation uh, and uh, possibly uh, skin surface. I view the inhalation could be a very dangerous uh, route of uh, intake because lung has very low metabolizing capacity. So that means the compounds would um, likely enter the systematic uh, circulation without much metabolism. So either way, if they're intake, we know they are absorbed. Uh, and then we know liver metabolism, and we know liver actually secrete uh, the both parent compounds and metabolites uh, back to intestine through biliary secretion, and that can go out into feces, or they can actually re be reabsorbed uh, back to the uh, circulation system. So, and then through the circulation, they can reach to different tissues, uh, including the kidney, and in some other unpublished data, we have found some organic cation transporter can actively uptake these compounds and kidney and has expressed a major form of that. And kidney, uh, either they can retain the compounds or they can uh, uh, excrete them out through urine. Uh, from the data in, uh, in animal, there seems to be some indication kidney may not be able to uh, excrete them very efficiently. That's why they have accumulated the highest level of these compounds. So just to summarize, um, I hope you can understand that these compounds, uh, as a foreign compounds, we do metabolize them. Our body has the machinery to be able to metabolize them. And um, we can quantify both apparent compounds and metabolites uh, fairly uh, uh, sensitively and targeted uh, in a targeted way. Uh, from a variety of uh, biological samples. And they are absorbed in human blood and urine samples. 
and we see uh, metabolites uh, in the urine as well. And also suggesting the fecal urine or blood uh, could serve as good biomonitoring samples. But if the blood collection is uh, you know, troublesome or not feasible during the COVID, a fecal and urine sample will be very good samples to, to monitor uh, for their exposure level in humans. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, my group, this is pre-COVID. Uh, I think I showed the same picture um, last year. So Ryan, who did most of the metabolism and uh, analytical work uh, on, on quacks, and Juicy and Vanessa did the animal work and uh, thank the um, funding support. We have a pilot um, grant from the School of Pharmacy to start uh, this uh, work on this project. And I'll be happy to answer any question that you may have. Oops. Thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, we have 15 minutes for, actually we have, um, if we need the time, we have just a little bit more because you finished a little early um, for uh, questions for Li Bin from both the panel and the audience. Yes, Oliver. Yeah, I wondered if you also had used accurate mass analysis to see if there are other types of modified versions like uh, glucuronidates or other types of metabolites that one could detect. Yes, um, uh, glucuronidation is a uh, very uh, possible metabolites. We have started to look at those secondary metabolites. Uh, we have seen some in human uh, hepatocyte incubation, for example. Uh, we haven't specifically looked for that and in the urine samples. Um, uh, we don't have synthetic standards, but we have standards from like incubation with um, human hepatocytes that we have some idea where they are. Yeah, very good points. They could have uh, the secondary metabolite that allows them to be uh, excreted more efficiently into the urine. Other panelist questions? I will, um, let me read a question that was emailed in from the audience. Um, in slide 15, oh, sorry, I should say um, this comes from David Dabney um, at Step and Company. In slide 15, you show that for most blood samples, the total quantified QAC is at or below 10 nanomolar. Can you comment on your prediction of the fraction of the QAC that is free and bioavailable in these plasma samples? And how much is likely bound to plasma proteins and thus not biologically active, given the known properties of QACs to tightly bind to organic materials. Do your methods differentiate free versus plasma-bound QAC? Uh, our message doesn't uh, differentiate them because we did extraction on the whole blood samples. Uh, on the uh, QAC potentially be uh, extracted into the lipid fractions. But that's a good point that the compounds they do tend to bind to um, protein, you know, in in the plasma, for example. Um, we're in the process of looking at that, you know, like how do they partition between, say, albumin versus uh, just free environment uh, in the solution. Uh, I think that's also a good indication that this compound could linger uh, in human body for a longer time because they have this tendency to bind to uh, proteins, albumin, like. And that could actually slow down their metabolism. And, and um, so, which could be an indication why, uh, you know, they could uh, be a detected, for example, long after exposure in animal models. However, in, in the, if we do the enzymatic reaction, their consumption are down in 30 minutes. So for example, so I think that's a, you know, that's a very good point, uh, but it does, uh, I think the longer half-life, uh, does it provide, I guess, the opportunity for the compound to be uh, systematically circulated into different tissues? Thank you for that. Other questions from panelists? A 
and Elizabeth, let me check in about, um, okay, I just saw that Jenny has a question and then I'll check in with Elizabeth. Let's go that way. Go ahead, Jenny. All right, Jenny, I don't think we can hear you. You can try again. Hi, I think I'm I'm muted now. There can you go. hear me? Okay. Thank you for your very, very interesting presentation and all your hard work that you've done on this issue. So it just sounds like my naive takeaway from what you presented is that you would think that urine would be a better way to biomonitor rather than blood, or is that too simplistic a, a takeaway? Well, I think urine during pandemic may be easier to collect, um, that you don't have to go in person to collect it. It's more convenient. Um, it definitely is, it'll be good to have blood because um, the profile I think will be different. What you in urine will mostly observe is very polar metabolites that they are water soluble, extruded out in the urine. But in blood, we may see the parent compounds or other less uh, polar metabolites. Yeah, but for convenience, urine is, is easier uh, to collect. Um, I would say fecal sample will be the best because I expect fecal sample to contain the majority of the information that's because of the uh, excretion routes that we have seen from, I guess, from animal models. Thank you. Jose. Okay, you still muted. Yes, I, I was waiting for Jose to speak. There, sorry, Al. Yeah. For some reason, the organizer muted me, I think, oh. while they were trying to unmute me. <laughs> so, okay. Um, uh, my question is Do you have uh, an idea of what the variability, in other words, like what the within individual variability um, and how that may compare to the between individual variability, say in urine, of uh, measurements of these metabolites? Yeah, uh, good point. I think, first of all, the exposure could be very, very different between the individual. And another thing is, I want to mention, um, many of the enzymes that are metabolizing these compounds uh, are kind of highly polymorphic. And there are certain individuals that are poor metabolizers. That means that means they could affect their, uh, you know, half-life in our body. They could affect whether we're efficiently, you know, clear them. In our, in, in our body. Uh, the CYP 2D6 is, is one of the uh, best known, if it highly, uh, it has a very high range of metabolizing uh, capacity uh, that vary in, uh, uh, among different individuals. Right, so I mean, that, I mean that's right. So it's a link between half-life exposure, recurrent exposures, and then you have metabolism all playing a role in that. I would, do you have any sort of information? My naive, I guess, guess would be that the variability in blood would be much higher than that of urine. Um, and I suppose the methods of quantification in urine may be a little harder because the concentrations, I would think, would be substantially lower in blood than they would be in urine. Um, can you comment a little bit on that? Um, you're saying uh, in the urine would be lower than the blood? The other way around, the, in, in the blood, would be lower than in the urine. As you as you uh, a bit more concentrated. Um, I think, I mean, from our data, uh, the, the collaboration with Terry Rubak and also the urine sample, we think the blood sample probably has higher level uh, uh, overall, particularly parent compounds levels. Urine, like I said, what we observe are kind of a terminal metabolizing meta uh, products. We think, yeah. yeah. And just just to follow up uh, on that question, with uh, with regards to the metabolites, um, are there any um, sources of 
uh, exposure to the metabolites that are not necessarily correlated with the exposure to the actual compound that we should be aware of. Um, sometimes this would happen like in the pesticide world when measuring, for instance, dioxyl phosphates, where uh, they are a marker of exposure to pesticides, but also if people are exposed to dioxyl phosphate, not actually the pesticide, then they would have uh, detection of, you know, the test will come up positive, positive value. So they're actually exposed to the metabolite, not to the actual pesticide, which kind of means something different uh, when it mm -hmm. comes to the toxicity of the chemical, right? Is there any notion about that, perhaps? Okay, I think you mean is whether this compound can, uh, you know, somehow transfer into the metabolites outside human body. Okay. Yeah. So I, from my current knowledge, uh, there's no evidence for that. Uh, I think from some environmental studies, um, this hydroxyl terminal hydroxylate products or uh, carboxylic acid products are not some of the degradation products that's observed in the environment, say. And um, so, and uh, I think some of the uh, people have argued whether uh, our gut microbiome can metabolize these compounds. Um, from my understanding, is gut microbiome bacteria, uh, because it's an anaerobic uh, environment in our gut, most of the transformation are actually not oxidation uh, in a metabolism in our gut. And these products we observed actually match really well with the human cytochrome P450 metabolism pathway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, Vina, I see your hand. And then we have a couple of staff comment questions and a couple of public ones. So please go ahead, Vina. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. I wondered if you had thoughts on factors contributing to the um, particularly high exposures and some of the the individuals um, amongst amongst the 43 you, you already mentioned um, metabolism differences could could play a, a role I wondered if you had thoughts on other factors yeah I mean certainly I think uh, some high exposure occupation um, janitors uh, you know healthcare workers they could um, be of really really high risk particularly at, I think in the, in the environment where you really spray these compounds often, uh, like I mentioned, um, you know, inhalation, this route of uh, exposure uh, go through the lung, the lung doesn't have uh, as much metabolizing capability. And that means you, you this compound will gain our circulation without being sort of detoxified. I would say, you know, those are probably uh, really higher risk population in here where uh, the spray I used often. I know during the pandemic, a lot of uh, environment use this and also use in a closed environment, uh, in a school, uh, you know, uh, some gym, I know. And and the, the spray, I think that um, uh, you probably heard about the, some of the micro band, those kind of thing, like on the TV commercial. I think those are kind of um, probably higher threat exposure route at this time. And, and also, I think uh, uh, last time there was some discussion on the asthma risk uh, associated with uh, occupational exposure. So that, I think that certainly increased uh, that part of the risk too. Thank you. Thanks. We have um, a couple of staff comments or questions. I think Nerissa. Hi, I just wanted to add on, thanks Lieben, that was great. Um, but um, Lieben mentioned the intra-program pilot study. This is a protocol we have for doing method development and demonstration. And as part of the samples that Lieben already um, described to you, we do have a small group of paired fecal urine samples from clinical workers. And um, it's a very small um, number. And fecal samples are not anybody's favorite way of biomonitoring. But we hope that it will add to this body of data and give us a better sense of the proportion of urine versus the uh, fecal um, metabolism, or yeah, um, rather um, excretion. Yeah, we definitely look forward to look at those samples. I think they are in, in the pipeline of our analysis. Awesome. Thanks. And Amina had a question or comment. 
Yes, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Lubin, for a great presentation. Um, I'm glad to see that we're sharing some interest in biomonitoring of QACs. Um, I was wondering if you are planning, or maybe you have uh, looked at ATMAX in blood, because we do see uh, almost 50% uh, contribution from ATMAX in our blood samples. So they are definitely present um, uh, uh, in equal quantity to BACs in the blood samples. And I'm afraid if you don't look at them, you miss that portion of the blood. And um, I understand that ATMAX can be metabolized more slowly in the body. So that can be uh, a reason for the higher presence in the blood. So do you have any comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Amina, for, for that uh, advice. I think uh, after hearing your talk, we definitely will look more uh, into the ATMAX compounds Currently, they are not on our targeted um, method, but we do, uh, you know, high res mass spec analysis too. So potentially, they are in in some of our, you know, profiling, uh, you know, spectra that we can we can fish out. Uh, but uh, definitely, I think we'll we'll try to add that into our tar targeted method, so we can get a, a more accurate uh, quantitation. Um, do you have a uh, I guess, uh, due to label standards for those compounds? Uh, I can't or... remember on top of my head, but I can check and uh, yeah. get back. I think we do. Okay, cool, great. Yeah, Thank yeah we'll be in touch. Yeah. yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks. Elizabeth, um, can you help us with the public uh, questions from the audience? Absolutely. Um, one of them was already covered, just very briefly. We had a question from Guoma Zhang about um, did you analyze some other metabolites, e.g. the hydroxylated QACs in urine? Um, I think that was covered, unless you wanted to add something else. Um, we did look for, for hydroxy products in urine. We didn't see that. Yeah, that's that's why I say, like, in the urine, likely those are, like, very polar metabolites that are excreted out through the urine. And the carboxylic acids are kind of the terminal products, very polar, highly water-soluble. That's probably why we see those uh, predominant in the urine. Thank you. And then another question. Have you noticed any contamination issues when analyzing the parent QACs? This is from Amy McDonald, University of Calgary. Yes, uh, it is a problem. So we always run blanks, like uh, including when do sample processing, we do a blank extraction uh, and carry that through. So that gave us some baseline level of what kind of signal we might see for that particular batch of, batch of samples. Yes, it is a problem. And and so we only view a uh, signal that's, you know, above or several times above the baseline level to be, a, you know, comfortable, say that's a detection. Uh, I think that's a, that's an issue for this. I think Amina stayed also showing that there's always some background levels around. Uh, also, I, I know that's another indication that uh, this kind of compounds are really used uh, very prevalently. Um, it could be in many of the solvent production, for example, like uh, in for our LCMS analysis, you know, could be in many of the containers too. So uh, trace level. So I think uh, it's it's certainly uh, everywhere. Yeah, it's it's very yeah. It'll be a good practice to do that um, blank workup and also run the blank every every once in a while during your runs. Okay, one more question and one request to speak. The question is an, a note on slide two content that um, about the statement that no public data on QAC exposure levels in humans and a 14 year old EPA document, the re-registration eligibility decision document being cited. Do you believe that all the exposure estimates in US EPA's 2017 work plans are somehow quote, not public or not relevant? This comes from Aaron Pollard of Pilot Chemical. Uh, I would say um, this, the cited data, I think, is um, uh, probably also, refer, you know, I cited those for their usage, you know, what were their use. Uh, I haven't seen any actually published data, um, say, human exposure level uh, in blood or in other biological samples. Yeah, so I think an EPA document could cite some of those numbers, but I really didn't see those original data, like in the where, where that is from. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, there's in the public domain, I, I haven't seen that, but if you have those data, please let me know. 
Okay, and there are now two requests to speak. Meg, if you have time for one or both, I will unmute the first person. Um, so, Jun Su Park, we're first. There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Su, uh, for a wonderful and informal, very informative talks. Um, my question may be a little follow-up to uh, what Dr. Finch asked earlier. Uh, I know this may be uh, likely very uh, simple and naive one. I remember the, uh, you showed, uh, the, I, I saw some of your observation on the uh, QAC distribution among organs, uh, uh, like lung, kidney, liver, and uh, blood. Uh, more prevalent in the uh, lung and uh, kidney system. I, I, I'm just uh, trying to get some hint uh, the, how much they exist in the uh, in uh, free form or conjugated uh, uh, general in general in blood or urine samples. I'm sure the um, uh, there will be also the you know the compound specific also people people specific you know the, also the uh, how recently they got exposed, uh, but uh, uh, I'd I like to get some idea uh, what kind of uh, uh, free form I, I can expect from the uh, 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 liquid, the, um, liquid samples like a blood and urine samples. I, I don't I know the. Have you done any uh, simple experiment like enzyme incubation? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yes. So we have done human liver microsome incubation. Um, but those are those in vitro experiments. They consume the uh, the quacks really fast, um, mm. and uh, and then for tissues and you know, those the study I cited, they are measuring the parent compounds. I don't think that they uh, I, I guess at the time of their study they know what kind of metabolite to look for. I don't think they measure any metabolites in those study, um, and we know that. Um, the parent compounds are substrates of organic cation transporter, for example, that's expressed in kidney that will uptake them. So that could be, uh, you know, one of the reasons they are higher uh, in the kidney. But we don't know yet whether the metabolites are also uh, the substrate of, of organic cation transporter. Thank you, Lian. We need to break um, now. For our transcriber um, and so we will um, have a chance to address other questions maybe during discussion at some point so we're going to go to a break now thank you very much for Libin for your presentation and your the discussion and we'll resume at 2 50 p.m thanks sounds good thanks